Hi there, I'm Dr. John White, WebMD's Chief Medical Officer and host of the Health Discovered Podcast, where we bring you fascinating stories and unique perspectives, like our recent episode on how heart failure can particularly affect women in Black and Hispanic communities. We've documented it time and time again. She was young, she was Black, she was a woman. No one expected her to look like the face of heart failure. When you don't look like what someone expects, that's going to lead to delays in diagnosis. We all have to take this constellation of symptoms, treat it the same each and every time. Whether it's a young person, a Black person, a woman, if someone presents to me with my heart racing and feeling winded, I need to get an echocardiogram 100% of the time, regardless. Listen to Health Discovered on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Christian Klingenberg greatly impacted Inuit settlements in the Arctic, from Nome to central Canada. Many of his descendants are community leaders and active in Canadian politics. However, not all stories about Christian Klingenberg are good. He returned from one fateful voyage with only five of his nine crew members on board. And according to the remaining crewmen, Klingenberg murdered the four who were missing. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. I have a great deal of respect for historians because history is often hard to pin down. Accounts about historical figures vary, and when I try to profile someone from the past, I often see a blurry version of the person, much like an old photograph. Most people are neither all good nor all bad. We fall somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Some accounts of Christian Klingenberg praise him for opening up trade routes in the Arctic. Others paint him as a cold-blooded murderer. I suspect both versions are accurate, but I will let you be the judge. Born in Denmark, Klingenberg left home at the age of 16 and took a job as a cook's assistant on the ship Iceland. He worked as a cook aboard various ships and voyaged to New York, Russia, Australia, Scotland, Honolulu, and San Francisco. It wasn't until he arrived at the Inupiat village of Point Hope on the ship Emily Schroeder that he fell in love and knew this was the region where he wanted to spend his life. Klingenberg reached Point Hope in 1893 when he was 24 years old. He jumped ship and married an Inupiaq woman he called Grimnia. Her Inupiaq name was Kimnik. These terms can be confusing, so let me attempt to explain. Inupiat is the singular form of Inupiaq. This story takes place in both Alaska and Canada. In Canada, the term Inuit is used for both Inuit and Yupiaq peoples. In Alaska, Inuit is not a spoken language, so the relative terms are Inupiaq and Yupik. The word Eskimo is often considered derogatory and has fallen out of favor. Kimnick taught Klingenberg how to snare ptarmigan and set out trap lines. Always the adventurer, Klingenberg soon signed on to a whaling boat, and by 1894 he was the pilot on the whaler Orca. He sailed to Herschel Island, an island in the Beaufort Sea that lies three miles off the coast of the Yukon in Canada. At Herschel Island, Klingenberg signed on to the whaler Mary D. Hume and spent the summer whaling in the Beaufort Sea. 
When he anchored the ship near Banks Island, an island west of Victoria Island in Canada, Klingenberg went ashore and was surprised to find footprints in the mud. Whalers had long believed Banks Island was uninhabited. Klingenberg decided someday he would return to Banks Island and trade with the Inuit who lived there. Klingenberg returned to Point Hope and spent the next decade raising and supporting his family by hunting and trapping. In 1905, Captain James McKenna became impressed with Klingenberg's knowledge of sea ice and hired Klingenberg to sail with him and his two ships, the Charles Hansen and the Olga, to Herschel Island. McKenna soon put Klingenberg in charge of the Olga, and the two ships headed east into primarily uncharted waters to trade with the local people. Accounts of what happened next vary. According to some sources, Klingenberg asked McKenna for permission to search for the mysterious band of Inuit on Banks Island. McKenna agreed as long as Klingenberg stayed within sight of the Charles Hansen. Other sources claim Klingenberg did not ask McKenna for permission. However, all accounts agree that somehow the boats became separated in the heavy fog. Klingenberg either accidentally lost sight of the Charles Hansen or purposely guided the Olga on another course. Some historians believe Klingenberg stole the Olga for his own purposes. The Charles Hansen returned to Herschel Island, where it spent the winter. McKenna assumed the Olga was lost and the crew had perished. The Olga carried Klingenberg, his sailors, and Klingenberg's family. To McKenna's surprise, Klingenberg and the Olga returned to Herschel Island the following summer, with Klingenberg's family and five of the nine crewmen on board. Klingenberg said he lost sight of the Charles Hansen and ended up south of Victoria Island, where he, his family, and crew spent the winter. He excitedly described the Inuit people he met from Banks Island, who had never seen a ship or a white man. He said the Olga became a trading post for the Inuit in the area. The whalers at Herschel Island were less interested in the band of Inuit Klingenberg had found than they were in what happened to four of the Olga's crewmen. The Canadian Mounties opened an investigation into Klingenberg. Polar explorer Wilhelmer Stephenson acted as a stenographer for the Mounties and recorded Klingenberg's testimony. Klingenberg claimed that some of his crew had raided the Olga stores to distill hooch from sugar and flour. Klingenberg said he had struggled to gain control of his men, but when he reprimanded his chief engineer, the man pointed a gun at him, and Klingenberg was forced to shoot him in self-defense. Klingenberg claimed the engineer died immediately. Klingenberg said one of the missing men had died from natural causes while aboard the Olga. He said the last two missing men had fallen through the thin sea ice while on a hunting expedition. Klingenberg's crew initially backed up the story told by their captain. Klingenberg grew tired of the Mounties' questions. He stole a whaleboat and left Herschel Island to return to Alaska. Once Klingenberg was gone, the surviving crewmen from the Olga changed their stories. They said they were afraid to tell the truth while Klingenberg was still at Herschel Island. According to the sailors, Klingenberg had called them on deck as the Olga approached Herschel Island. He said, Boys, you know the penalty for killing five men is the same as for killing four. You know what happened to the four of you who are not here today. The same thing will happen to the first man who tells on me, and maybe to the second and third. Let me take a short break from this story. In addition to writing about true crime, I am also an author. I've written four Alaska wilderness mystery novels, as well as a nonfiction book about the wildlife of Kodiak Island and a nonfiction true crime book. In Murder Over Kodiak, a float plane mysteriously explodes over Kodiak Island, killing the pilot and his five passengers. 
In The Fisherman's Daughter, a serial killer stalks the residents of the island, and authorities rush to catch him before more women die. In Carlick Bones, two young men set out for a hunting trip on Kodiak, expecting the adventure of a lifetime. But instead, they find themselves in the middle of a terrifying nightmare. And in my most recent novel, Massacre at Bear Creek Lodge, someone murders the owners and guests at a remote lodge on Kodiak Island. Read one of my novels and take a trip to beautiful, dangerous, mysterious Kodiak Island. For more information about my books and where you can find them, please check the show notes or search for my name or the titles of my books on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online bookstores. According to Alfred Carlson, a cabin boy on the Olga, the chief engineer, Jackson Paul, did level a gun at Klingenberg. But then he said he would not shoot the captain if Klingenberg forgot the incident and didn't beat him up. Klingenberg agreed, but four days later, Carlson heard five shots. Carlson found the wounded Paul still alive and lying in his bunk. Paul told Carlson that he had been reading in his bunk when Klingenberg told him to fetch wood. Paul refused the order, and Klingenberg said, Hell, if you won't pick up wood, you are a dead man. And then Klingenberg shot the engineer. Jackson Paul refused to die, so Klingenberg ordered the cook to poison him. The cook agreed, but then substituted sugar for the poison. According to Carlson, Klingenberg paced the deck until he could stand it no more, and finally he walked up to Paul in his bunk, put a pistol to Paul's head, and killed him. The crewmen told the Mounties that the two men lost while hunting had witnessed Klingenberg murder Paul. The men were hunting with Klingenberg when he claimed they fell through the ice, but the sailors believed Klingenberg murdered the two men to keep them from testifying against him. The fourth man did not die of natural causes, as Klingenberg had claimed. He, too, had witnessed Klingenberg shoot Paul. So Klingenberg ordered him chained in the ship's hold. The man died of either starvation or exposure. Britain, Canada, and the United States took a keen interest in the suspicious deaths on the Olga. James Bruce, ambassador to the United States, advised Secretary of State Elihu Root that although the alleged murders occurred in Canadian waters, the Olga was an American ship and her crewmen were American citizens. Canada agreed to turn the matter over to the U.S. government as long as the U.S. authorities promised to prosecute. Root passed the case to the Attorney General and ordered officers in Nome and Barrow to watch for Klingenberg. When Klingenberg heard he was wanted, he surrendered himself to the authorities in Barrow. They arrested Klingenberg and transported him to San Francisco, where he was indicted and tried for murder. Several of the Olga's crewmen traveled to San Francisco and made formal charges against Klingenberg, and the San Francisco newspapers chronicled the terrible stories told by the crew of the Olga. Nome's U.S. attorney, W.N. Landers, traveled to San Francisco to prosecute Klingenberg, and the trial began in November 1907. Unfortunately for the prosecution, the crew members' original testimony on Herschel Island sharply contradicted the charges they made in San Francisco. Klingenberg was a talented storyteller, and the jury chose to believe him over the testimonies the sailors gave. The jury acquitted Klingenberg on all charges, but many in Alaska and on Herschel Island thought Klingenberg was guilty, at least of the murder of Jackson Paul. Klingenberg and Kimnick had a large family, and Kimnick and their children were an asset to his trading career because they could communicate with the Inuit people in Western Canada. Klingenberg was the first white man to trade with the Inuit on Victoria Island, and his daughter, Weena, often accompanied him as an interpreter. Klingenberg established several trading posts, including a permanent post at Reimer Point on Victoria Island. 
For many years, he was able to avoid customs laws regulating the trade between the U.S. and Canada. The border between Canada and Alaska lay slightly west of Herschel Island. However, in 1924, the authorities finally cracked down on trade in the far north between Canada and Alaska. In 1924, when Klingenberg sailed his ship, the Maid of New Orleans, from Alaska to Canada, headed toward his trading post on Victoria Island, authorities informed him of a policy prohibiting American ships from bringing foreign goods into Canada. Klingenberg asked for permission to deliver supplies to his immediate family. The authorities agreed, but said he would need to pick up a Royal Canadian Mounted Police Constable to accompany him to Victoria Island. Klingenberg complied, but on the return trip, RCMP Constable McDonald disappeared, and searchers found only his parka and a notebook in the icy ocean. Constable McDonald was not only a policeman, but was also the grandson of Sir John A. McDonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada and the founder of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The RCMP carefully investigated the incident. Considering Klingenberg's suspicious past on the Olga, some suspected him of murdering Constable McDonald. However, the authorities could find no sign of foul play and ruled McDonald's death an accidental drowning, vindicating Klingenberg. Klingenberg was a naturalized U.S. citizen, but he gave up his U.S. citizenship in 1925 and became a citizen of Canada. He retired to Vancouver and died in 1931. What happened to the four crewmen who perished on the Olga in the winter of 1906? Klingenberg admitted to shooting and killing Paul, but did he shoot him in self-defense, or was it cold-blooded murder? If, as some historians believe, Klingenberg hijacked the Olga and its crew to search for the band of Inuit on Banks Island and establish new trading partners, then maybe the crew revolted. Klingenberg perhaps killed the four sailors because they disagreed with his decision not to return to Herschel Island with McKenna on the Charles Hansen. Did Klingenberg also murder Constable McDonald to silence him from reporting Klingenberg for unlawful trading practices? Klingenberg was never charged with the crime, but some folks remained suspicious. Christian Klingenberg made his mark on history as a pioneering trader in the far north. Was he possibly also a serial killer? Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. If you haven't already done it, be sure to join the Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier Facebook group and chat about the podcast. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier.